Good afternoon, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, you can imagine, obviously, uh, being here in Cyprus, in Nicosia. Um, as somebody that is made in Cyprus and exported to the USA, I must say that I'm more of a Cypriot than an American. And therefore, I take very good pride in representing our country all over the world, and I do not, for a moment, hesitate to tell the world that I am Cypriot. Okay, so after speaking um, last week, uh, a couple lectures in Chicago and what have you, um, flying here via Atlanta over New York into Charles de Gaulle and into Larnaca, here I am today and in a couple of days I'll be in New Delhi and Pune in India and then in Kathmandu, Nepal and back to Cyprus next Friday. And so life goes on and I'm delighted that my Cypriot audience is here, and I can turn you on by just saying, in Dambu <laughs> All right. So that is, I just wanted you to know that I do speak fluent Greek and Cypriot, and anything goes. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to talk to you about a very revolutionary area that is going to change the world, the way that we think about and how we execute things. I'm going to talk to you about the most powerful cell that we have in our body, namely the stem cell. And stem cell is uh, the basic unit of life that we all have, millions of them in our bodies. And then we can trigger various different types of activities uh, that we can give command to a cell like that to rescue us, if you will. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this rescue thing. Um, stem cells, obviously, are, like I said, they're in millions in our bodies. They move around, they execute things properly, and they replicate, just like everything else. So via mitosis, that's just cell division, uh, the cells can obviously divide into two. The one can give rise to a neuron cell, or, and of course, replenish itself automatically. So we don't run out of gas here. We've got plenty of it. Um, then, of course, we do have two different kinds of stem cells. We have the embryonic stem cells, and we have the adult stem cells. We have embryonic stem cells as long as we're an embryo. After we become adults, then we lose those embryonic stem cells, and we have plenty of populations of adult stem cells. Now, I'm going to point out to you that obviously we lose a great potential when we, we get rid of the embryonic stem cells, because embryonic stem cells are very potent stuff are the ones that obviously occur at a very early stage at an embryo, and then they give rise to all the tissues that we know of that make you up, which is about 236 tissues in your body. Then, of course, the adult stem cells are just localized, so to speak, and they can sort of um, rescue various different organs at different locations at different times. In other words, the heart has its own adult stem cells, the liver, the kidneys, the intestines, the skin, and what have you. And so when those things are injured, those adult stem cells are highly specialized to go to that tissue level that is damaged and rescue it, rehabilitate it. If you have a heart attack, that's what you go to. And if you don't have any stem cells, you better call your cardiologist and your heart expert to rescue you because you don't have an internal rescue system per se. Um, the magic thing about what we do in the stem cell area is the fact that we are learning how to educate them and how to give them commands. And that is really the most exciting thing that is happening to us today. Imagine for a moment if you had a hundred kids and you let them loose in the schoolyard without a teacher and without an education, they're going to become a bunch of outlaws. But if you train them and you give them special commands and you know the language that they speak, then you can take this endothelial cell and make it into a mesothelial cell, which, of course, can rescue your skin. So we can make skin cells out of giving specific commands to those cells, and I'm going to talk a little bit further as we go along. Now, if you think that this is just a kind of a shouting game, that you shout at the cells and say, yeah, come on, I want you to come over and have a cup of coffee or a, a something else with me, obviously that's not as easy as that. In order to do these kinds of things that I'm describing to you, you need a couple of basketball teams of experts. Now, if you don't know what a basketball team is, it's a member of five people that play basketball. Two makes it ten. 
So we have to have engineers and computer experts and doctors and scientists and, and uh, all kinds of things, including obviously behaviorists and uh, ethologists and uh, uh, all kinds of different denominations, because very simply, if you do the wrong thing, and I discovered that to be the case in America, and I ended up obviously before various uh, audiences, uh, they can chew you up and spit you out live and in color. <laughs> so here I am now, I am thrown in before the Congress of the United States to testify for sperm cells, for stem cells, rather, and clone embryos. Now, how do those two relate? I'm going to explain further as we go along. However, I was able on uh, August 7th, 2001, to tell the Congress of the United States to get down to their census and stop politicizing things and appro appropriate money and begin to legislate in order to protect people like me and others to get ourselves involved in this kind of research because they simply we, we know how to maneuver and manipulate the most powerful cells in our bodies and we can change the world that we how we diagnose a disease and how we treat a disease. Therefore, those are remarkable things that, um, that um, we have to do. Now, if you think for a moment that speaking to the Congress of the United States is an easy assignment, think again. Because by simply, you can obviously motivate a bunch of crooks how to make sense and listen to the people of America. Um, I want to tell you that in the cloning business, which of course is related to stem cells, we were able to write up some very serious milestones and we published these data, so nobody can argue about that. We were able to create the first clone embryos in the history of the world. We were able to transfer the first clone embryos in women to get them pregnant and give rise to a child clone. And then of course, we were also able to develop a lot of different technology that enables us to understand how the system works and how we can put it to work. Uh, just to give you an example, we created the first clone hybrid embryos via which we use cow eggs and human genome. And we put it all together and we had a hybrid clone. Now, this hybrid clone cannot survive and give rise to a child. However, we were doing this in order to understand how the dynamics work when we put the human genome into a cow egg so we can understand how we can put the human genome into a human egg and get results. And we were able to achieve a great deal because when they created Dolly, they used 370 eggs to create 22 clone embryos. That's less than 5% success. We were able, with this modeling business that we do, to obviously um, be about 50% successful instead of only 5% successful. And those, those, those were part of our criticism that we received. Now, we understand today that in order to create um, a three-dimensional tissue, that we need to teach those stem cells how to climb up on a scaffold and begin to, to build a three-dimensional configuration um, type of a structure. Uh, furthermore, we were able today to sort of develop the modeling business and begin to treat various different types of diseases that obviously people suffer from, anywhere from skin, to liver, to spleen, to pancreas, and then of course we are hoping also to, uh, to rehabilitate people that are, are missing limbs, and I'm going to discuss that uh, as we go along. One thing that is really very exciting, I gave a talk at King's College about a few years back, uh, how to treat an, an infarct, a heart attack, using stem cells. And I took the work of a Texas group that today has revolutionized the way that we treat heart attacks in humans, uh, and by so doing, we can infuse the stem cells that you see here through this uh, tubing that is delivered at the side of the infarct, and uh, we have a special system that is developed and can be delivered in a three-dimensional configuration at the side of the heart attack and deliver the goods, and by so doing, obviously, initiate the rehabilitation process of heart attack victims. Now, normally a heart attack victim loses about 60 to 80 percent of the tissue when they have an in, a, a heart attack. With this, they lose that less than 20 percent of the tissue. Therefore, they regain and they do it faster. 
So this is remarkable technology. And of course, you know very well that in America, we die a lot from, from heart attacks. In, in Cyprus, for instance, it's um, the number one killer, as I understand. And it's about time that Cyprus gives up the frappe, the souvlaki, and stop walking if you want to live longer. Now, we also created the first clone embryos or embryos via embryo splitting. Um, what we do here is that we are able to take a four cell stage embryo that you see here, remove two cells out of that, bring them over here and shoot them directly into a zona that is empty, and we can create two embryos that are clone of each other. They're identical twins. Now, when I went to England and I said, I want to create the first human being that um, can come with a spare tire, I really meant to say that the first embryo can be made into a baby, the second embryo can be frozen and used later, 30, 40, 50 years later, as, as a source of embryonic stem cells in order to rehabilitate, uh, in order to rehabilitate the, that individual in case of an injury. Moral of the story is that, that we want to look futuristically. We want to look down the... I mean, if, if a car manufacturer can create a car with a spare tire, why can't we create a human with a spare tire? We need it. Now, we came a long way, and today we can create actually stem cells from skin cells, and therefore we may not this, we may not need this particular technology, but think for a moment that you can take this and then freeze the other embryo, and then 20 years later, you can say, I really want to have a twin brother born. Let's transfer it and see how the little one looks. That would be remarkable, wouldn't it? Um, scientists are now capable of making stem cells from skin cells, as I indicated. This is really revolutionizes the whole picture about how we're going to deal with stem cells in the future. And stem cells today are used for in vivo as well as in vitro, meaning we can do it in a live situation or in a petri dish where we can create things and put it all together. Um, we can treat people with uh, joint injuries. We can treat people with liver deficiencies and liver diseases. Hepatitis A, B, and C is killing the world, especially the Bs and the Cs. And of course, if you keep drinking, you're probably going to need one of those anyway. So that's the future. Now, recently a group in LA developed this technology, which of course is not too far off, that we can infuse the stem cells. Oh, I'm so sorry, I went too far. Um, uh, they can infuse the stem cells after we grow them in a petri dish inside the posterior chamber of the, of, the, of the eye, and by so doing, we can regenerate the retina, which is the tissue that enables you to see. And for those people that have detached retinas or injured retinas, then that becomes an issue. Now, I happen to be an, a, an organ transplant myself, and I had a cornea transplant about two years ago because I suffered from a... a um, cornea laceration, changing a light bulb in a microscope, being a dedicated scientist. I blew up a, a light bulb that cut my eye and injured me, and I had a cornea transplant, and today, because of that allotransplantation, meaning that I used a, a, a cornea from a, a cadaver, from a dead person, to transfer into my left eye, I have to infuse the um, immunosuppressant that, supp that suppresses the rejection of my cornea every day. Now, if we create embryos or anything from the stem cells or the, uh, any cells that you have and we transplant them in you, this particular problem is alleviated completely. Therefore, the, the rejection of the tissues, which happens up to 60% of the time, is not quite there. It's less than 20%. And therefore, the complications are reduced tremendously and success rate goes up sky high. Now, our team, because we're reproductive specialists, we develop a technology now, and I can't talk too much about it because we haven't published it yet, where we can take males that do not produce sperm cells in their testes, and by infusing stem cells in the testes directly, we can get those testes to go back to producing stem cell, uh, sperm cells again, and those men can obviously biologically reproduce and have biological children of their own. That's very important, and we Cypriots take that very seriously, don't we? Now, this scaffolding business is very important because we're simply, by creating three-dimensional configuration scaffolds, we can teach the stem cells how to create a trachea. 
This is a human trachea that is developed in vitro and is ready to be transplanted in an individual that obviously had tracheal cancer of some sort. Therefore, this is very important, and we can do this routinely. Routinely meaning that anybody that wants a trachea, we can take a plastic tube that you see here, embed it with a bunch of stem cells around it, and differentiate into, obviously, epithelial cells and what have you, and create a trachea that can be trans transplanted in you, and then you don't have a problem. Now, this is done for the first time almost five years ago in Spain. Today, it's becoming a routine process, and it's very successful, incidentally. Now, I want to show you this particular picture and, 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 and tell you a little bit about this for a moment. I was going to show you a video yesterday, but today I decided not to, but just to describe for you that now the technology in the laboratory can create an image of a heart. And now by using three-dimensional printing, as we call it, we can take that hard image in a three-dimensional configuration and have the three-dimensional printer over here. Instead of infusing ink, we're infusing stem cells, and therefore uh, those stem cells can create an organ that can be transplanted further. The sky is the limit. Can we grow legs for this man? We have thousands of those amputees, due, thanks to George W. Bush and company, that created them in Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq. Uh, and so now we are somewhat, the, the, the Pentagon is spending millions of dollars to create technology that we can rehabilitate those people. So long story short, ladies and gentlemen, the facts are that what I just told you is not a story. Stem cells are here to stay, and the facts speak for themselves. This is no fantasy anymore. This is the real thing, and I thank you.